That'd be fun. Um, yes, you're going to get started and then I'll swap into your. All right, good afternoon and welcome to our session today on other completed or near completed geospatial impact evaluations. We have five presenters that will be speaking today. They are all at the front of this table. Uh, after each presentation, we will hopefully have time for questions and answers. If not, please feel free to find each of these presenters and pull them aside to ask your questions. So thank you so much for joining us. Rachel Sayers will be our first presenter. And Dr. Sayers is a research scientist at Aid Data's Research and Evaluation Unit, where she conducts impact evaluations on a number of different development topics. She combines econometric and GIS analysis methods to design and conduct rigorous evaluations with an emphasis on causal identification. She co-created Aid Data's Gender Equity and Development Initiative, which focuses on bringing Aid Data's geospatial research expertise to the gender space. So Rachel, the time is now yours. Uh, thank you, Jessica. Um, so today I'll be presenting on gender-related bias in agricultural surveys in Ghana. Um, and this is work that was done with a number of my colleagues at A-Data, including uh, our lovely moderator. So if you have any difficult questions, please feel free to direct them to her. Um, so this work is founded in a long line of literature that talks about how couples respond to surveys. Um, and this literature demonstrates that couples often disagree on both uh, reports of asset ownership and decision making. And actually um, this discrepancy within couples is often quite large. So Ambler et al look at this in Bangladesh um, and they find that 9% of couples disagree on who owns agricultural land. 38% of couples disagree on who owns small livestock and 39% disagree on who makes decisions on agricultural production. Uh, Silvario and Murillo look in Mexico um, and also find large discrepancies. They find that 11% disagree on whether the household owns non-house land or not, and 26% disagree on if the household owns farm animals or not. Um, and my favorite part of this report is that 24% of couples disagreed on whether there was a refrigerator inside the house. Um, so obviously there's a lot of disagreement, um, even on things that we consider completely objective. Um, but despite this ample evidence on disagreement, actual bias has not yet been measured in the literature. Um, so how should we think about bias versus disagreement? Disagreement just tells us that a husband and wife's um, responses differ. Uh, bias, it goes a step further. Um, so bias tells us how reports differ from reality. Um, but in order to know reality, we need an independent third observation that we can compare reports to. Um, so why is this um, research important? Uh, well, agricultural surveys typically only interview one household member about agricultural plots. Um, and often this uh, household member is chosen because they are the one who makes the most decisions about plots and production, according to the person we ask. Um, and this is typically ends up being the man. Um, and even in cases where multiple household members are interviewed, it's hard to know how we utilize reports that are different between spouses. Um, so we hope to shed some light on all this um, by looking at how bias might be introduced if we interview just one member of the household and how multiple reports might help us understand uh, bias better. Um, so we have two main contributions. The first is that we extend this literature I've talked about, about disagreement. Um, and we show that there is disagreement between uh, within couples, even on basic uh, characteristics of agricultural plots, such as size, distance, and whether they were left fallow. Um, our second contribution is that we are able to address bias. And this is because we have an independent third um, observation to compare it against survey reports in the form of GIS. Um, and we are able to look at bias both by gender and by decision-making roles. Um, so our sample is couples in three regions of northern Ghana. Uh, couples are eligible for this uh, sample if both of them make decisions about at least one household plot within 30 minutes. Um, and it's important to note that sampled villages had recently been targeted by the One Village, One Dam uh, program in order to receive a small earth dam in the community. So the sampled villages may be different than other villages in the region, but within the sample, they're all similar in that sense. 
Um, so we have three main pieces of data that we'll use um, in this presentation today. The first is a household survey. This household survey includes retrospective histories um, on the plots, including things like plot size, following, crop type, and harvest. Um, we also ask both the man and the woman about uh, decision-making power on the plots, as well as decision-making roles more generally in various domains. Um, and importantly, we interview the um, man and the woman separately at the same time um, so that we can get their reports individually. Um, the second thing we collect for that independent third observation is the GPS of plots. And we do this two ways. The first is by having enumerators walk the boundaries of the plots with tablets to collect the data. You can see that here. Um, and we again, we do this separately, the man and the woman separately where possible. Sometimes they refuse to do that and walk together, but in general, it was done separate where possible. Um, we also collected plot corners um, just to have an, an additional measure. Um, so over here, you can see what this ends up looking like. Uh, we end up with two different uh, plot walks around the boundaries. And in these two examples, the couples uh, generally agree. This is not always the case. Uh, we also do lab in the field games. I'll just talk about them briefly because they're not in the results you'll see today, but you can think of these as a measure of decision-making power that has real stakes. So it gives us additional information over what we ask in the survey. Um, so the first set of kind of results I'll show you is just descriptive statistics about disagreement between um, individuals in a couple. Um, so when we first went out to do this, um, survey, we expected there to be lots of disagreement on things like amount that was harvested, um, crops that were planted, maybe um, plot size. One thing we didn't necessarily anticipate is that uh, couples might disagree on the number of plots that a household makes decisions over. Um, so in this uh, table, you can see we have the women's report as columns and the men's report as the rows, and the shaded cells on the diagonal are agreement. Um, so anything outside of those cells is disagreement. Um, and there is quite a bit of disagreement. In fact, only 73% of couples agree on the number of plots within the household. Um, anecdotally, we saw cases where um, a woman would report a small garden as an important plot for the household that the man neglected to report. So this could explain some of this and kind of highlights uh, the danger of just interviewing one member of the household. Um, so since we uh, interviewed men and women separately about plots, the order that they talked about the plots would differ. So we can't reliably match up plots on the basis of just the survey responses. Instead, we employ the GPS walks and look for overlap to match them up and ensure they're talking about the same plots. Um, so this shows kind of the overlap in this. Um, the x-axis is um, the area of the over overlapping area divided by the area of the female reports the other axis is for men. Um, so this bottom corner is one, and sorry, it's restricted just to um, plots where there is some overlap. So this bottom corner would be, there's barely any overlap, probably just mistakes. Uh, the top right corner is 100% overlap. So they both report the same plot boundaries. Um, then kind of this side is a special case, for instance, uh, where the the plot that the woman reports is completely contained within the plot the man reports, but he reports a big plot. Um, so we have some kind of examples. They're a little bit hard to see, but on the other side, so the top one shows um, one plot boundary is completely contained within another boundary, but the second boundary is larger. So, uh, and the second one shows two small boundaries reported by one member of the couple, um, and the other member of the couple reports that just one plot, but much, much bigger. So these are some examples of discrepancies. Um, so obviously they don't always agree on boundaries, um, but from here on out, when we're going to limit our sample to where there is the top right corner, so where there's over 90% overlap on both axes, and this just helps ensure that they're talking about the same plots. Um, can you advance the slides, please? Thank you. Um, so, um, next, we look at plot size. Um, we're actually able to see the actual plot size using our GPS walks. Um, so this axis is the size that the female reports minus the actual size when we have the same for men. Um, so the point of zero, zero means that they both report the same size. And in addition, they both report an accurate size. Anything else on the dotted line is agreement, but maybe it's incorrect. Um, anything over the line means the man reports 
uh, a larger plot compared to reality than the woman and vice versa. So as you can see, there's a lot of disagreement in plot size. Um, we have a similar graph for productivity, although this is just reported because we don't have an actual measure of productivity that's in the same units. Um, and as you can see, there's very little concordance along the dotted line. Um, and it seems that men, um, like saying that there's larger harvest unusual than women. Um, and then find the last thing I want to show you on disagreement is on female ownership and female decision making. Again, the shaded cells are agreement. Um, so as you can see, there's very little agreement on ownership. Um, only 54% agree on women's ownership roles on the plots. Um, the most common disagreement is this cell right here, where the woman says she has partial ownership and her husband says she has none. Um, this is for decision making. There's a little bit more agreement. Um, here we have 69% agree on women's decision making roles, but it, that means there's still a lot of disagreement. And the uh, most common disagreement is this cell where the woman says she has no decision making power, but her husband reports that she has some. Um, so the next set of results I'm going to show you, we move away from this disagreement into this bias. Um, so we look at how uh, men and women are reporting differently, um, accounting for the actual measures that we can see through GIS. So here we look first at plot size, um, and we find that um, men are over-reporting uh, plot size more than women. Um, next, we can shift to look at distance... Next, we can shift to look at distances um, from the plots or to the plots from the house, sorry. Um, and we can account for this uh, a little bit more noisily than size because we use the straight line distance from the residence to the nearest point on the boundary of the plot. So it's a little noisier, but we can still account for the actual distance. Um, and what we find is that um, men report shorter distances to plots than do women. Um, we also look at um, how they report whether staple crops were planted and um, whether there was any intercropping. And we're able to do this interacted with a remotely sensed measure of fallowing. Um, so the most important finding from this is that in plots where we see remotely sensed that it's fallow, women are less likely to report that they planted crops um, and they're also less likely to report intercropping. Um, similarly, we look at harvests that are reported for some staple crops, and we find that for all of these staple crops, maize, millet, and groundnuts, women report lower levels of harvest than men do if we can see that it's fallow through our remotely sensed measure. So just to conclude, um, there's some main points you want each to take away. The first is that there's significant disagreement within couples, even on the most basic plot characteristics, including how many plots are in the household, plot size and distance, that sort of stuff. Um, there's also gender related bias in reports about agricultural plots. Um, and so all this put together demonstrates the inherent danger there is in just interviewing one household member about agricultural plots, especially if we default to um, interviewing the person who make, says they make the most decisions, which would typically end up being the man. Um, so do I have time for questions, Jessica, or no? Okay, any questions? Yes. We haven't done that yet, but we have that data and it's a great question. Um, maybe I'll take someone from this side of the room and then. Is it empowerment of women or discrimination in like within the household towards women or there are disputes? I don't know what kind of outcome ultimately that you, you want to measure. Thank you. So I think ultimately it would be helpful if we could find perhaps something about these couples that is unique, that maybe explains why they disagree, um, that we could then 
potentially when we're surveying, recognize that these couples are different. Maybe we need to interview both of them. Uh, potentially it's also just important to know that the bias is different for men and women. So that if we are doing any bias corrections at a later stage, we can account for that. Um, also potentially, as you mentioned, there might be something we can change about surveying to improve that number. So maybe 70% is good, but we could bump that number higher. So I think there's a lot of innovations it could take to. Do I have time for more? Anthony D'Agostino from Mathematica. Just a couple of questions about the role that uh, tenancy plays in this. Uh, so I wonder if renting in or renting out plots is one factor that's causing a discrepancy, at least in the plot count, obviously not affecting distance to plot or, or plot size, as well as differences about what the household is and who constitutes a household member and therefore would be uh, their plots factoring into the total household plot count. Yeah, they're both those are great questions. Um, so I don't necessarily think this gets around the first concern, um, but we asked specifically not about ones that they own, but rather about uh, plots that they actively manage and only requested information on those. Um, for the second concern, sorry, can you repeat it? <laughs> about who's in the household. Oh, yes. That's a great question point as well, because um, another interesting factor about the sample is that they're um, polygamous households often. Um, so when we encountered a polygamous household, we randomly chose the wife from all wives that met the criteria. Um, so it, there is potential, maybe the wife only reported her and her husbands, but not other wives. So that's possible and definitely something we could investigate more of differences between monogamous and polygamous families. One more question. household surveys? No, we don't have that recommendation yet. It's still in the early stages. So hopefully one day we can tell you what to apply afterwards, but not yet. Great question there. Okay. And thank you. All right. Up next, we have Mr. Andrew Agunko, and he is the Chief Quality and Methods Advisor with the Independent Development Evaluation Unit of the African Development Bank. Uh, he serves as principal advisor to the evaluation general, managers and evaluation teams on appropriate evaluation standards, approaches, designs, methods, and tools for evaluation work. So Andrew, the time is yours. Okay, okay. thank you very much. So I'm going to present about the impact evaluation of, uh, of, of last mile Connectivity Project Phase 1 or that supported universal access to electricity in Kenya and targeted uh, 284,200 households and 30,000 businesses. So uh, this uh, project is actually in line with the Kenya development strategies and also the bank's development strategies. And uh, it was actually meant to maximize the use of existing electricity infrastructure by targeting households or within the 600 meter radius of distribution transformers. So the activities uh, that were conducted by the project included uh, uh, expanded uh, low voltage network by 12,000 kilometers, installed meter boards, poles, conductors, and LV stays for beneficiaries within the transformer protection distance. So those are the activities of, of the project. So we have a theory of change here that uh, tries to look at the outcomes that we, are we were interested in. And uh, you can see that uh, we wanted to see the effect of access on uh, uh, reduced cost of energy, change in composition of energy consumed, increased use of grid electricity, increased access to grid electricity, increased use of energy, increased use of electric home appliances, increased productive use of energy. And this is particularly important because uh, it is not just about access to electricity, but what do households actually do with that access? So that was very, very critical, and it's a, a critical uh, uh, strategy of the bank to ensure that when households access that electricity, they use it for productive purposes. And then we also looked at other outcomes along the theory of change, like better air quality in the house, changes in, in the use 
uh, less time spent on the course, children study, etc., and increased employment, increased access to information, increased business and agricultural productivity. So arising from increased productive use of uh, electricity and other higher level outcomes such as stability well-being, improvements in health, women empowerment, improvements in education, and increased uh, household income and consumption. Uh, can I move to the next slide? OK, OK. So the methodology, we were not able to use a randomized uh, control trial uh, because the placement of transformers across regions, countries and sub-counties at large scale was not practical. And this therefore meant that we used a quasi-experimental impact evaluation design uh, that estimated the causal impact of the project by controlling for confounding factors. And the spatial regression discontinuity design was based on the 600 meter radius around the transformers. So that households that were within the 600 meter radius were the treated households. And those outside were actually the controlled households. So the identification assumption is that households and businesses on the two sides of the cutoff are comparable in all respects, except their eligibility for the LMCP phase one. So we also conducted uh, a balancing test on certain covariates to ensure that the, the two groups were actually comparing in all aspects. So for those covariates, if there was a statistically significant difference in any of those covariates, then it meant therefore that those two groups were not comparable. But fortunately, all the covariates that were were, were considered did not show any statistical significance significance in the two groups. So uh, the sampling strategy actually employed uh, administrative data, GIS, and also satellite imagery. And this was done for the six counties that were targeted in phase one of the project. And if you see, if you look at the diagram on the right hand side, you can see the blue dots actually represent the treatment households. The red dots represent the control households. The, the green lines are the L LMCP or lines, and the red lines actually represent the existing or lines. And the diamond, the blue diamond represents the transformer, the L LMCP transformer. So the green shaded area is actually the control area, and the blue shaded area represents the, the treated area. So overall, the sampling strategy was successful in selecting the right control and treatment households. So we were able to get the right counterfactual using a mixture of administrative data and or GIS together with satellite imagery. So after analyzing the GIS data of LMCP phase one cables, we realized that some households were actually connected, but they were outside the 600 meter radius. Oh, that was very important. So oh, the contractors did not actually follow the protocol because they were only supposed to connect those households that were within the 600 meter radius. So due to this, we were not able to use the sharp regression discontinuity design that we had hoped to use. And that is the reason why we use the fuzzy Regression, regression, uh, fuzzy regression discontinuity design, which allows for a small jump in the probability of assignment to treatment at the threshold. So we could not use the sharp regression discontinuity design for that because we realized some households were actually above the 600 meter radius of the transformer. So we were also able to uh, to triangulate results using qualitative analysis of key informant interviews, FGDs, FGDs and uh, stakeholder interviews. So these ones were meant to actually ensure that we were able to explain some of the quantitative uh, aspects of the data, quantitative estimates that we found after an analyzing the data. So robustness checks were also conducted using OLS. So there are a number of limitations, but most of these limitations were actually mitigated uh, using the 
the first irrigation dis discontinued design uh, that, that I have talked about. So I'm not going to dwell that dwell into that. And as I mentioned before, we also did a balance test on a set of covariates. So to just to compare whether the two or the control and the treatment groups were actually similar. So the outcomes, you, you can see that we, we were able to get uh, positive results on a number of outcomes that we tested along the theory of change. So you can see there was increased access to electricity by around 85% and also use of electricity for lighting increased by about 83% compared or from other sources by 17%. But there is one important uh, result which, which uh, should be noted here. So limited increase in the productive use of electricity, which was actually uh, supposed to be uh, the main outcome uh, of this particular project. So households owned businesses connected to the national grid 7% and use of agricultural activities such as irrigation by 17%. So the limited use, uh, the limited increase in the productive use of electricity was largely due to the, the cost of electricity, which, which is actually very high. So preventing households from using electricity, which they have access for productive purpose, purposes, which could actually uh, incre increase their household incomes and consumption. And that's the reason why there was no statistical difference in household income between the treatment group and the control group. So we also see other positive outcomes like probability of studying at night or uh, in treated households increased by that percentage. So you, you see no evidence of impact of the project on business ownership because of the fact uh, which I've just talked about, the increased cost of electricity in Kenya. So that is an area which policymakers must actually pay particular attention to when actually providing access to electricity, the cost. So we, we have uh, all those outcomes which I'm not going to talk about now because I have mentioned them. Statistically significant effect on reducing the ownership of other sources of electricity. I'm not going to talk about all these outcomes because of time. So uh, what do we learn from this impact evaluation? In a nutshell, we are saying that a high cost of electricity relative to the household income of beneficiaries undermines access and the productive use of electricity which was actually meant to increase household incomes because households are not supposed to access electricity just for its own, own sake. Because access means nothing. But what do you actually do with that electricity that you have accessed? So that is very critical. The financial sustainability of the electric, electric utility company is a critical success factor for the quality and reliability of electricity provided to eligible households. That, that's a, a very important lesson that we learn. A mixed method approach provides valuable information to understand the results of an impact evaluation. As I have explained, quantitative data may not actually mean much if you, have, if you do not use qualitative uh, data also to explain the quantitative parameter estimates that, that you obtain after analyzing quantitative data. So we also have uh, a combination of satellite imagery, GIS data and adaptability in evaluation design based on field data are key to evaluating infrastructure projects, not only infrastructure projects, but even in other aspects as we saw in earlier presentations. It, it is key because using GIS and the satellite imagery together with ad administrative data, we were able to actually get um, a valid counterfactual for this evaluation. We were able to identify the control households and the treatment households accurately with some degree of accuracy. So an effective project communication strategy is key to increasing households participation in electrification projects. I think that one brings me to the end of this presentation. Yeah. So, so, so questions? Oh yeah, so many questions indeed. <laughs> yes, we can start with the... Uh... Just a reminder to use the mic, so handheld okay. or throughout your table. Yeah, my question is just about the methodology. Um, at, uh, From at the beginning, you mentioned that 
as a way to kind of address uh, the contamination issue, you use a fuzzy RTT. I'm kind of whatever. How likely is that fuzziness, as you call it, affect the the? So what what happens is okay. that uh, when you use a sharp regression discontinuity design, then the assumption is that all those households that are going to be treated must be within the 600, 600 meter radius of the transformer. But when we analyzed the data, we realized that households were connected when they were not supposed to be connected because they were outside the 600 meter radius. So we could not use the sharp regression discontinuity design to analyze because the assumption was violated. You see. So the first regression or uh, discontinuity design allows for a small jump in the probability of assignment to treatment at the threshold. So uh, it therefore means that uh, uh, the 600 meter threshold does not actually determine, does not completely determine assignment to treatment, but it, it, it increases the probability of assignment, but does not completely uh, determine assignment. Yeah. Oh, any any question? Yes. Thank you. Um, I have a question and a comment, please. So, was the district that you surveyed urban, peri-urban? Yeah, or... they were. I I mentioned in, uh, in the introduction they were rural and peri-urban households that was so, they, that were connected to. Thank you. So the comment then that I have is, for example, in Nigeria, we assume higher electricity will automatically lead to higher productivity, more pro food processing, other small scale. And I'm wondering what that does to our assumption, because a big argument that has been made over the years is the lack of electrification. But you've just proven 85% yes. increase, but only a small, it can't just be money. It can't be the cost of the the electricity units. Yeah, so thank you. So actually, uh, the major determinant why the households were not able to, even from qualitative interviews that were conducted, the major reason why people were not able to put that electricity to productive use was the cost. In Kenya, the cost of electricity, I think, is one of the highest. It's very high, actually. So they cannot actually put it into productive use. Even households, as we speak, most connected households are not even able to use it for lighting as we speak because of the cost. Even for lighting, which was actually supposed to be the basic, uh, the cost of electricity is very, very high. And that is the reason why I said in the beginning that that is something that policymakers need to take into account when or uh, providing electricity to poor households. Yeah, the cost of electricity will actually ensure that people do not actually use that electricity to generate income from small businesses. Because this project was intended to ensure that households that were connected could actually use that electricity for other businesses that could ultimately increase their household incomes and well-being. And that was not achieved. So it is something that I, I think or policymakers need to look into, not just providing access, but the, the cost of accessing that electricity once, once they are connected. So that is very critical. Yeah, it goes against what you are saying because of the, the, the fact that in countries where the cost is prohibitive, then it actually prevents households from or using it for productive purposes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Arthur Mabiswa from IFAD. I have a couple of points. One is that you say your sample comprises of both businesses and households. Yes. And my, just uh, hypothetically, I think your outcomes could be different in terms of whether the electricity is used for productive purposes between businesses versus households. Uh, at least uh, some tentative information we have from data from our own data from Lesotho suggests that when you invest, support uh, businesses, they are more likely to actually use electricity for processing, agro-processing. The second point has to do with the, uh, the, the, your definition of productive use. So in, in households where typically consumption is the main focus of how they use uh, electricity, 
and most likely lighting because that's cheaper than maybe other mm -hmm. purposes. You may also find that, and I don't know if you have data on this in terms of uh, sort of household level productive activities, whether it's cooking or uh, I don't know, various types of, of activities that may not necessarily be business oriented in terms of sale, but is actually leading to consumption uh, at the end, but is still now improving welfare with respect to household productive activities. So I don't know if your data allow you to explore this uh, different uh, aspects. Thanks. Over. Yeah, actually, there was, uh, we also saw a statistically significant uh, difference in consumption, but not household income. And uh, this could probably be explained by the fact that the, the connected households, most of them acquired or uh, TV sets, you know. So what happened is that consumption or uh, consumption actually uh, increased in the connected households, but not household income. Uh, be because if you uh, if we measure household income based on consumption and expenditure, using uh, consumption and expenditure data, then if if consumption is significant, we expect household income to follow suit, which, which was not the case here. Uh, and, and I think it could be explained by the fact that these connected households were able to uh, buy uh, appliances, costly appliances like uh, TVs, you know, which brought about the difference, the statistically significant difference in consumption compared to the control groups. Yeah. Time is over, I think. So thank you very much. Maybe you can see me later. Okay, wonderful. Uh, next, we will hear from Dr. Nicholas Sitko. And Nicholas is a senior economist in the Inclusive Rural Transformation and Gender Equality Division of the Food and Agriculture Organization. He coordinates a research team dedicated to generating rigorous empirical evidence to improve rural development policies and programs with a thematic focus on economic inclusion and climate change in rural space. Great, thank you, and uh, welcome everyone to RUM. So uh, the presentation I'm making today is not going to be an impact evaluation. It's, it's an exploratory study, uh, descriptive, but it's kind of leading into future impact evaluation. So what we're gonna look at are welfare, welfare dynamics uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa using a spatially explicit perspective. So we're gonna examine these across various typologies, but with time limitations, we won't touch on all of it. Um, do I have to, anyways. Okay, so you guys are probably all familiar with this kind of figure, right? This is World Bank headcount poverty data for Sub-Saharan Africa. We see a very sharp decline in poverty rates over the last 30 years. Now, these, the, this information is coming from where? It's coming from household surveys, right? So this is kind of the frequency of household surveys that are, that are informing this kind of aggregate number, right? A lot of variation across space, right? So some places zero, some places four, some places too. So, you know, what's going into this is fairly messy, right? Um, okay, so that kind of gets to our motivation, right? We wanna, we, we have a, a set of challenges in terms of tracking and analyzing poverty dynamics in places that don't have frequent surveys. And what are they? Well, we don't have frequent surveys. We don't have the information. We don't have necessarily comparable information across countries and across time. So not all surveys are the same. And the data are not typically representative at lower administrative levels, right? Best case scenario, admin one, um, but we don't really know what's happening underneath. And why does that matter? Well, poverty is obviously still very high in the region. Um, and that persistence of poverty and economic stagnation that's associated with it probably has some pretty distinct spatial features to it, right? Um, so market access, infrastructure, agricultural potential, et cetera, probably all sort of influence these dynamics. There's also probably pretty important spatial or temporal dynamics there as well. So uh, economic shocks, extreme weather events, conflicts, et cetera, are all in there that we're not necessarily picking up when we have two surveys done every 10 years. Um, so what we wanna be able to do is better understand the spatial and temporal features around poverty dynamics, wealth uh, and well-being generally, 
because that's really, I, I mean, ultimately critical for, for doing a better job of targeting the kind of interventions that we want to target to address these, these challenges. Where do I aim this? Go ahead. Okay, so okay, so that that's going to be our contribution um, is to kind of look at these spatial and temporal dynamics. We're going to do this with the Atlas AI data set. Um, we have Vivek here. I saw you come in. Where are you? There he is. So he's 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 one of the people behind this data set. So any technical questions, pull him aside uh, afterwards. But so this is a, a very very disaggregated, spatially disaggregated data set that tracks various welfare dimensions over the period 2023 to, to 2021. For all of Africa, we're focusing on Sub-Saharan Africa here, uh, as well as South Asia. Um, we're adding to this data set three territorial typologies to help us kind of unpack what's happening. So we're adding to it the ORCA data set, which is urban rural catchment, uh, which is essentially a travel time measure, a spatially explicit travel time measure that identifies pixels based on how far it takes them, a person in that pixel to travel to an urban center of I think 20,000 people or so. Um, that's the one I'm gonna focus on today. But we also added to it the uh, global agroecological zones. So these are based on precipitation, temperature and elevation, and then farming systems, which are kind of based on the, the, the types of crops that are grown in a particular area, or, or let's say agricultural activities, livestock as well. Okay, so hypo hypothesizing that these all are likely to influence these, these dynamics, right? Uh, forward? Okay, I'm not gonna go into the details on Atlas AI, but, but very briefly, it is, uh, it's a set of three welfare indi indicators. So asset wealth, uh, expenditure and poverty um, that is constructed beginning with survey-based data that comes from the DH, uh, DHS surveys using a principal component analysis to construct these indicators, then feeding it into a machine learning algorithm that is then trained with spatial data that are relevant to wealth and poverty dynamics. If I correct me if I'm totally misrepresenting. Um, uh, so that allows you to then kind of take that, that those, those, those survey data and then expand outwards to cover space and time where this information is not covered. Comparing these, uh, creating these normalized indicators that are comparable within and between countries. And these data have been validated in a couple places already. Forward? Okay, these are the, these are the, the, the variables. Uh, so we have asset wealth. Uh, so basically normalized, uh, zero is your, your yearly average. So greater than zero are wealthier pixels. Per capita expenditure uh, is referring, it's, it's, it's kind of converted into 2011 um, uh, international dollars per person per day. So it's expenditure uh, within these pixels and then a poverty measure, the population living below this $190 a day poverty threshold. Um, so this map gives you a sense of what these kind of look like, okay? So this is just comparing uh, changes in the asset wealth index between 2003 and 2000. 21, where red is they've stayed below average in both years. Yellow, there's been an improvement. Blue, which we don't really see here, there's a decline. And green is persistently above average. So this kind of gives you a sense of what's happened. We see some improvements. We see large areas of, of stagnation and then a few pockets of kind of consistent uh, uh, higher values. Forward. Forward, somehow. Okay, ah, there we go. Okay, just want to start with the averages. So this is these are these are uh, SSA averages. Okay, so uh, of these indexes, we see pretty sharp uh, rises in in asset wealth, spending, large declines in poverty. Except when we pull out the the urban areas, so these are only rural uh, pixels, we see that the story is a little bit different, right? So fairly stagnant with respect to poverty, slower rates in, in, in terms of uh, uh, per capita expenditure. But, you know, asset wealth is growing now. Some of that asset wealth is not just people's individual assets, but it's also public assets, roads, electricity, et cetera. So what we did to kind of start unpacking this is that we started with the kind of looking at the quantiles. And what we did was we took the quantile distribution of, of asset wealth index in 2003, put each pixel into a quantile, and then looked at how things changed over time with respect to all these outcomes. 
And it's kind of an interesting story because what you have is your, your richest quantile is always richest by a lot. Um, we see a lot of growth there. But what we also find is your bottom quintile, this dark red, is showing quite a bit of growth, much more than these other, these middle quintiles. What are these? What are these? What's going, what's going on there? Well, these are actually 70% kind of urban places. So these are kind of informal settlements, places where there is more economic dynamism. These are almost 100% rural areas where there's, there's virtually no change. Um, there we go. So to kind of further unpack this, we looked at the URCA. So again, I said this is a travel time measure. We created four categories. There's, I think, 30 of them initially. Uh, but basically, we have strictly urban. We have peri-urban, which is like within an hour of travel time, uh, one to three hours for what we're calling peri-rural, and then hinterlands, where it's greater than, greater than three hours of travel time. So the story is, uh, again, as you move away from urban centers, your asset wealth, your expenditures, and your poverty, well, your poverty goes the opposite direction, but um, they, 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 you know, they go down. So your hinterlands are always the poorest. Um, where you're seeing a lot of dynamism, again, is in your urban areas and your peri-urban areas. Poverty reduction is mostly con concentrated in urban areas and peri-urban areas to a, a more limited extent. Your hinterlands, almost, almost no, no change. So bringing it all together, um, obviously spatially explicit poverty data has potential to improve our understanding of what's happening across space and time. We're not saying that we should treat this as the replacement to survey-based uh, approaches. Obviously the surveys are feeding into this approach anyways, but you know, survey-based approaches are also necessary for understanding contextual factors, micro-level dynamics, et cetera. Um, so thinking of it this more as a complement. Um, the results highlight kind of major constraints to wealth creation and poverty reduction in rural places, right? We, we know this is the case. When we further dig into it in terms of agroecological zones and farming systems, what we find is there's two areas, uh, two agroecological zones that are performing particularly badly. Those are your tropical lowlands and your, your, your arid regions. Those are places that have a large share of the population in the surface area of Sub-Saharan Africa. And under most future climate models, those are areas that are gonna get bigger. So we gotta start thinking about what do we do to address these challenges in places that are gonna start expanding spatially as a result of climate change. With respect to farming systems, more diversified farming systems, places that have more access to markets do better, more cash cropping, et cetera. But there's real questions about scalability. Can you replicate those in arid areas? Maybe not, right? Um, so next questions are gonna be related to what we do from using this data for impact evaluation. Questions are gonna be related to climate change and how that affects uh, these dynamics, as well as what the implications are under future scenarios. And then exposure to conflict is also an interesting one with the ACLA data set. So that's it, thank you. Okay. So once you start, I mean, this is true in general of the spatial data, but once you start looking at their categories, it would seem like migration becomes really, really important, right? And, you know, the, the size of the, or the number of people living in that pixel may be shrinking while they're moving out of the, out of the accelerating urban areas. So um, I, that's obviously being ignored here, but does, does it make it worse when you stratify by um, really pick out these sort of areas that are likely to see a lot of migration? That's a good question. I mean, so we we haven't we haven't looked at that, and but we we're interested in it. I mean, each of these pixels have been adjusted for kind of an annual population right. uh, estimate. So we're trying to account for it, but we're not necessarily accounting for that dynamism of moving in and out. Um, we've talked a bit about approaches to doing that, and of course, it's wildly complicated. As yeah. you could expect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, of course, a huge uh, important question. Hello, uh, thank you for the uh, interesting presentation. My name is Dunstan, I, I'm with the World Bank. I guess just being from the bank, um, I, I just wanted to clarify and I guess make some corrections on some of the, I think the, the, the motivations uh, on, on your work, especially the introductory slides. 
Um, so I think for the estimation of poverty, so number one, I think for this service, I just have to say, maybe you already know that the living standards measurement service, LSMS, they are pretty standard. So I think all of the countries which do this service are very standard. And so those are the, I think those are the main services which are used to produce the, the main poverty numbers by the World Bank. So the standard is pretty much the same questionnaire across um, across countries. So uh, I, I just wanted to clarify that, I think. Um, and then of course the, yeah, you're, you're right. I think in general, we don't have very good poverty numbers at lower administrative regions, but again, we, we have some methods, uh, small area estimation, um, you know, using the LSMS survey and census still enables us to, you know, to get some sort of uh, poverty estimates at admin two, even got going to admin three, depending on the country. So it's still possible. Um, but otherwise, I think even at the bank, we are working in this, uh, we are going the same direction of trying to use your special data to have, you know, um, much more granular estimates at some level of uh five kilometer uh, uh, grid resolution. So, uh, and then finally, I think just to agree with you that yes, um, although we are going this direction, but replacement is uh, kind of replacing surveys is still kind of far away because as you rightly noted, the estimates from Atlas AI, I don't have good details, but they still need survey data to train the models, right? They still need uh, DHS data, they still need uh, data from living standards measurement service to train the models. So, which means without the survey data, Atlas AI cannot have. So I think we still need some good way to to use geospatial data, uh, set of images to, to have maybe even new measures of welfare without maybe relying completely on, um, on survey data as ground truth. But yeah, that's... Mm -hmm. Agreed. Definitely. Um, anybody else? Anna Paula. Sure. I think, and Vivek, Vivek can correct me, but the consumption and poverty uh, estimates come from the LSMS, not from DHS, right? That's right. Yeah, that's... Yeah, uh, it's calibrated using uh, the LSMS data, and of course, uh, that particular data production process benefits a lot from the LSMS. LSMS at scale has been produced in, I think, nine countries, if, if I'm correct. So the focus is in specific countries where there's been agreements with those entities to conduct the multi-year longitudinal surveys. Um, but I think that, and, and then we also calibrated using the World Bank's uh, PPI tool, the poverty uh, tool which gives us some macroeconomic distributions, but but I think part of the point that Nicholas is also making is that waiting for those very long and and legitimate surveys to be completed to give us some amount of information uh, does sort of create obstacles in the need to move quickly, often on some of these more compelling issues. So this is why it's an important complement, not a substitute. Yeah. Thank you uh, for the presentation. I had a quick comment that I was just wondering how this survey or the, the study that you are doing is different than the MPI that has been done uh, for the Sub-Saharan Africa and it's generally done by UNDP. The multi-dimensional poverty index I mean, well, so multi-dimensional poverty is obviously different than consumption expenditure assets and and uh, income poverty, right? So it's accounting for a wide range of assets uh, that households have, human capital, things like that as well. So this is kind of following more, uh, well, number one, and I, I don't think that that's been replicated at at, at a, a spatial, in a, in a kind of a spatially explicit way like this. So that's, again, using kind of survey-based approaches um, yeah, and and small area estimation approaches, but uh, so I mean, this is this is kind of providing a little bit more spatial and temporal granularity, um, but not measuring necessarily multi-dimensional poverty, which is somewhat different. Okay, I have one more. Uh, okay, well, Arthur's from around here, so we can talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I was just going to ask if there was any attempt to break it down. 
gender? <laughs> Last part of my question. Vivek, do you want to respond? Yeah, so um, for every pixel in, in any of these longitudinal um, data sets, we do have um, an option to to use age gender bands to actually break it down. So you could do that by age. Uh, there's also um, some studies that triangulate occupational patterns at those resolutions with that population age gender um, breakdown as well as these uh, asset wealth and uh, consumption expenditure data sets. So that's also available. Cool. Thank you, guys. All right, up next, we have Miss Fiona Castell. And Fiona is a research associate at 3IE, where she leads the data innovations group and provides research, uh, program management, and data analysis support for multiple programs on agriculture, education, finance, health, and policy and institutional reform. And just a reminder, the microphones are so that the online audience can hear you. So please wait to grab them and then introduce yourself before you speak. Thank you. All right, thank you all. Um, I'm really excited to be here presenting on our geospatial impact evaluation uh, in Niger. <laughs> okay, uh, so the Sahel region of West Africa is extremely arid, dry, um, and food production or agricultural production is extremely difficult in these conditions. Um, so in order to increase food security and resilience, the government of Niger, with funding from the West African Development Bank, implemented a multifaceted agricultural intensification project in three regions in Niger, in Ibohaman, Dugarawa, and Namaro. And this agricultural production initiative included a variety of different interventions, which are mapped here for Ibohaman. Um, this included dunes, irrigation, uh, rehabilitation and reforestation. Uh, today we're focused just on the irrigation perimeter highlighted or uh, circled in red here. Um, we have the same sorts of interventions mapped in Dugarawa with again a focus on the irrigated perimeter that was implemented there. Um, we have in in Namaro there was also there are plans to implement an irrigated perimeter that have not that have not been begun yet and so for the purposes of this study it's not included at the moment. So briefly, a timeline of these activities. So the reforestation and rehabilitation activities, which included the dune fields, tree planting, and different seeds, started occurring in 2013 and 2014. And then the irrigation and the use of the irrigated perimeters began in 2018. So the question that we wanted to answer is, what is the impact of the developed irrigation perimeters on agricultural production? And then also, what is the impact of those other interventions, uh, the improved seeds and land rehabilitation on vegetation, desert desertification, and water availability? Again, today we're focused just on the first question. Um, and a note I wanted to make is that, so the West African Development Bank that's funded this work is interested not just in using geospatial data for evaluating some of the outcomes, but looking at monitoring as well and um, looking at changes over time and seeing whether or not the programs were implemented in the first place. And so one way that we can do that is just, again, looking at a time lapse of the irrigated perimeter in Ibohaman, you can see the construction of the perimeter just visually the increased, those lines in the red circle. And so we can see that the irrigation was implemented. So the question is, what was the impact of that? So we used a variety of data sources. Um, we had a process evaluation with records of those activities that were occurring and geocoordinates um, with some descriptive information about those interventions. And then we mapped the, perimeters around each intervention area, which was what I showed in the previous slides, uh, and then had photos and notes to go along with those polygons. And then our primary data source then is satellite data that we extracted for each of those polygons, specifically from Landsat 7, CHIRPS, and TerraClimate. So to answer this question of what was the impact, uh, we use a controlled interrupted time series analysis with matching and a synthetic difference in difference. I'm not going to go into detail on these methods here, but happy to answer more questions later. Um, but the 
primary idea here is that we have our treatment group, so the irrigated perimeters in Ibohaman and Dugarawa, compared to a control group, which is made up of other agricultural perimeters that are matched on those on the pretrends and the outcome and some covariates. And we end up taking the difference before and after for each of these uh, for the treatment compared to the control group. And that's to isolate the effect of that intervention in 2018. So we have a couple of outcome indicators we looked at, including NDVI, SAVI, and NDWI, uh, with a focus on NDVI today, but the idea is to measure uh, crop yield or agricultural production using NDVI as a proxy. And then we also have some covariates, precipitation, and temperature, since those are likely to affect the levels of agricultural production as well. So just to give an example of some of the control units, since this was not a randomized um, experiment, we don't have a control groups to begin with, but we were able to identify other agricultural plots in the, uh, in the surrounding region, both some that included directly in the vicinity. So for instance, right next to Ibohaman, there was another agricultural perimeter, which did not receive any sort of irrigation in 2018. Um, and then we have a few others um, in the nearby vicinity. Some, for instance, this one is underneath a dam with agricultural plots, which is similar to our intervention, which is also underneath a dam. Um, and then we have, again, another one, which is not underneath a dam, but has, so is less likely to be irrigated, but still it's agricultural plot. So we have a variety of those put together to create our control region. So looking at the results, um, looking first at our matched controlled interrupted time series, we can see a strong, significant positive effect of the irrigation on NDVI over time. So here the solid line is, again, our treated units, uh, Ibohaman and Dugarawa's perimeters, and the dotted line is the weighted average or of those control units that were most similar in the pre-period. And um, you can see that there's a large increase in the treated units compared to the control units after our intervention occurred in 2018. And so that effect is essentially a 9.3% year over year increase compared to the baseline level of NDVI. And then we also con conducted the synthetic diff and diff, um, which allows for a slight difference in the levels of the trends. It doesn't force them to be matched exactly the same, thereby including more units in our control group. Um, and we find very similar strong positive effects of this irrigation on NDVI, specifically a 33% average increase compared to baseline, which is the same, essentially the same as the CITS results, which was a year over year effect, while this is the average in the post period. So we find strong positive effects, um, but that's for the regions combined. So looking at both Ibohaman and Dugarawa's irrigation perimeters, um, but we also wanted to look at those split out to see if there was a difference in the effect for one region versus another. And so just looking in the top uh, row at our covariates, rainfall and temperature, we can see a similar trends both before and after in those covariates, um, maybe slightly different levels, which we would, were controlling for. Um, and you can see a dip in 2023 when there was a drought. So that aligns with our expectations and again is a reason to control for those. Um, and then, but then if you look at NDVI or just the raw trends in NDVI over time for each region, you can see that for Ibohaman, which is the green line, uh, there is that sharp increase that we saw looking at both regions together. But then for Dugarawa, which is the purple line, it follows the same trends as the control region in the post period. And so we wanted to look at the effect of those split out. Um, so for Ibohaman, you can see just again over time the construction of the perimeter before and after. And then looking just at the synthetic diff and diff, um, we see about a 60% average increase compared to the baseline level of NDVI. So really large, strong effect for Ibohaman's irrigation perimeter on crop yield. But for uh, Dugarawa here, we can see again, just before and after photos of the irrigated perimeter, maybe slightly less um, obvious in the post period as compared to Ibohaman. And we, that translates again into the results uh, where we're still seeing a positive effect of the irrigation, but it's a much smaller, and this is also more sensitive to the control regions that end up being included in the final sample. And so um, this begs the question of what is going on in one region versus the other. So overall, we find, again, a very positive, strong effect of irrigation on crop yield. Um, 
but it differs by location. And so there are some outstanding questions about what was going on in Dugarawa compared to Ibohaman in either implementation or the um, use and uptake of that irrigated perimeter. Um, and so, but in, in general, regardless of the methodology we used and the robustness checks, um, we find, again, the strong positive effects. So we also looked at monthly analysis, a shorter pre-period, different outcomes. So for instance, Savi is, uh, should be better at predicting or better at detecting vegetation in really dry and arid regions, such as this one. Um, but again, the results are very similar. And then we've also started looking at pixel level matching where we, instead of selecting the polygons with agricultural activity beforehand, we uh, sample all of the pixels in the surrounding region and match on the pixel level instead of the polygon level. Um, so, and then we have a few next steps to continue engaging with BOAD, um, looking at the impacts of the other interventions and potentially exploring some of the uh, heterogeneity and reasons for why there's that difference in Ibohaman and Tukurawa. Um, and again, it's just this is a valid approach for retrospective impact evaluation using so solely open source data that hopefully can be replicated in the future and look, especially if we want to look at the long-term impacts. And I think that's all. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So the increase in VI values could either be a growth in biomass, which is indicative of, of yield increase, or it could also be a shift in cropping. So do you guys have plans of taking a look at phenology over time to see if there is any evidence of crop shifting that when irrigation became available, folks were shifting to water intensive crops. And therefore this longitudinal analysis is combining both yields as well as which crops people are growing. And that's, and that's changing over time. Yeah. <laughs> Anthony D'Agostino from Mathematica. Thank you, Anthony. <laughs> yes. So this is a really good question. We um, haven't, so we do have some information on what crops were being um, or what the land was being used for, but it was aggregated at a level for both the irrigated perimeters and the surrounding regions. So we're not sure exactly what was going on in the specific irrigated perimeter. So I definitely think if we do that qualitative follow-up to look at what was going on in one region versus the other, that would include asking questions about what crops specifically were used for the specific areas, because very good point. <laughs> Yes. Hey, Dan Stein from ID Insight. I'm interested just to hear a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of how you pick the control area. I'm kind of imagining you like staring maps and circling things, but is there like some cool algorithm you use to pick the best pixels? And also you said that, that it was weighted. Is that like a standard synthetic control kind of thing or something else fancy? Yes, yeah, also a good point. So this is this was part of, um, this is why we wanted to do this as well, is to try and figure out ex post, like how can we construct a counterfactual without having control units already mapped out, right? So part of it is we had other polygons already mapped where we knew there was agricultural activity where that received interventions in 2014 and not in 2018, no like irrigation. And so we included those. And then we also went out and looked at other perimeters that existed in the region. So we don't have administrative data on those. It was just from visually mapping them. Um, but this is also why we wanted to do the pixel level analysis because we don't wanna be going out and selecting just random agricultural plots. And so ideally, the idea with the pixel level analysis is we take some circumference or area around the irrigated perimeters and then get pixel level like NDVI and other outcomes. So smaller, like maybe 500 square meters all in throughout that entire region. And then the model that we're using, which is where the matching comes in, it essentially finds the control regions with the most similar trends in NDVI beforehand, as well as trends in the rainfall and precipitation and what other, whatever other covariates we can include. And so it's basically for the, for the match CITS, it is a synthetic control where it matches on trends and levels for all of the control regions, drops those that are not similar and weights those that are most similar. And then for the diff and diff, synthetic control diff and diff, it's also similar, but it allows for a difference in the levels, um, which because the difference in difference gets rid of that difference in levels. And so you have a larger control group that's valid. Yes, but I'm happy to discuss this more because that's what we're trying to 
figure out how to do this better. Any other questions? Yes. Peter Foster Brown. So I guess uh, uh, you see, you see the difference in the two areas, right? Um, I couldn't, I don't quite remember. Was it, was, is it that the treatment moved differentially or the control moved differentially or is it a com combination? Um, for the Ibohaman versus Dugarel? Yeah, 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 yeah. What's... Yeah, so we they're in two different regions, right? And so the control, like the, yeah, the it's possible that the control- It looks like the treatment moved us. differentially in the one that, that sort of worked. But these mm -hmm. are really, really noisy relative to the gap in the treatment. So, uh, you know, I, I, it makes, make, makes me a little nervous about interpreting two years when they're moving so much, right? This, yes, especially this one, you can tell the trends are not as clearly similar. And that's yeah. another reason potentially for the pixel level analysis. If we have a larger group, maybe we can find those that are most similar. Um, but yeah, and and also the post period is small. So that's right. Yeah. So ideally yeah. we can easily repeat this in a few years time to check if it, it's sustained. Cause you see the dip also, because we know there's a drought in 2023, maybe that will affect. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So. I just uh, actually more of a follow-up comment to uh, the gentleman's question. Uh, so uh, Vivek from Atlas AI. So I, I think you, you may even want to look into the noisiness of the NDVI itself, because there might be post-processing implications on that NDVI, especially if you're using an existing uh, open source product there. Uh, the ones that are typically available, uh, they they don't often include the right kind of smoothing there. And so you could think about, you know, how to get rid of that as you're moving to the pixel level analysis. That's really helpful. Yes. Uh, yeah. We downloaded the data with just from um, Landsat 7 and haven't, I mean, we adjusted for cloud cover, but that's a good consideration as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, to round out our session this afternoon, we will hear from Dr. Julius Eduepo. And Julius is a postdoctoral fellow and geospatial analyst for maze-based systems at IITA. And prior to joining IITA, he acquired multidisciplinary experience in natural sciences, geospatial applications, and corporate management. His PhD research focused on the impact of management intensification on soil carbon dynamics and underlines important ramifications for long-term ecological sustainability, especially in subtropical grasslands. All right. Well, thanks a lot for the introduction. I just want to say that uh, I thank everyone for We've been very engaged in the LART. Uh, so we're gonna be switching gears a little bit here. Uh, my name is Julius Adewokbo, and uh, I would like to talk about something totally different from what had been said about my background. Uh, so I'll be talking about how we linked crop disease incidents to ancillary variables to do two things uh, for cropline mapping and to map climate related risk. Um, I, I should give you a, a bit of a, you know, clarification of expectation here that this is more of an inspiration talk it's it's not directly linked or associated with evaluation but it's, i think it might become a bedrock for how we conduct evaluation moving forward uh the other thing that i should uh let's see if this works hmm. uh okay no the other thing that i should talk about is that this presentation is going to be focused on three major parts uh and the first part will be the well, I'll give you a context and I'll talk about the first part, which is about the data opportunity that we had and uh, you know, crop, how we conducted a cropland a coverage assessment and now we translated, translated that into climate risk assessment. Um, I have a few slides to cover, so I think I better get on with it now after this clarification. So the context here, oh, by the way, I should also let you know that for each of those sections, uh, there are papers that our group has published. And you, I welcome you to see more details because I'm not going to be going to the methodological details of everything I'm going to talk about. I'm going to give you the eye level snippet and I'm happy to answer questions and to engage further after this presentation. Now, for those of you who are very much familiar with, uh, with Rwanda and East Africa in general, banana is considered to be one of the major food security crop. Uh, as a matter of fact, in Rwanda, you consider banana as either, you consider Rwanda as either uh, the first or the second uh, highest per capita uh, consumption, uh, you know, as a country where you have the first or the second highest per capita consumption of banana in, in, in the entire world. Um, and generally it's represented that about 25% 
land of the arable land is you is cultivated with banana. Realize also keep this in your in your mind at the background that I think about ninety five percent to ninety nine percent of households grow banana in some form or fashion, either as a large farm or just as a backyard crop that it can always fall back on. And for most part, you know the the production is targeting local needs. And everything seems to be going so well uh, for a long time, uh, at least historically, until they started to see, or was, so we started to see some sort of trouble in paradise, supposedly. Um, if you look at this chart, um, if you look at this chart, this is about you know the past 20, 25 years, uh, data from FAO and, and World Bank. This chart is showing the population trend in the red line and this uh, the green and sort of the orange color is showing the banana production over time, uh, you know, dated back into the past 25 years. I'm gonna summarize the viewpoint here so that we don't waste too much time here. Banana production has reduced uh, by about six or 5% of, so within the past 25 years. And guess what has happened to the population? doubled, 100% increase. So we're talking about food security and there's a decline in the primary food security crop to start to imagine what the outlook is for this growing population in this country. Okay, um, now you ask, okay, why is there the decline? Is that, why is there a decline in banana production? The anecdotal word on the streets is that two major things, uh, management and disease has uh, led to this massive decline over time in banana production. Uh, one of the major culprits is this banana xanthomonas wilt. It's a mouthful, but it's called BXW for short. Um, it's uh, one of those uh, diseases. It's a viral disease that has been decimating banana lands. There's really no control. There's no uh, major biological control for it. And there's no breed, improved breed resistant variety to really take care of this. There are you know, research along those lines, but this is a lingering problem. And uh, one of the major challenges specifically of this disease is the fact that as soon as it attacks a banana stand or grove, it's a hundred percent lost because you have to literally cut off the entire plantation for you to get rid of the disease. Now, the implication of this for the farmer is that you have almost two years, 21 months of yield gap, because after you cut, you have to reestablish the stand. And it takes about two years before you start to you know, harvest crop from this land again. Now we saw, we started to think about this more critically, uh, I think about 2018, uh, our team in, in Rwanda. And we realized that as lingering as this problem is, the last effort to really understand what's going on in Rwanda was in about 2007. It's actually across the uh, Great, Greater Lakes region where data was collected, observation were made on, you know, the incidence of BXW. But fast forward to 2018, we asked the question, you know, where, is the incidence of this disease? And there's no answer because nothing exists. And the question is, how can you monitor, how can you control what you cannot monitor? So that fundamental question drove us to a major project that we started out in 2018, where we started to, it was funded by GIZ, by the way. So we started to tinker on this idea that it seems that we, like, we have the recipes to start to really innovate in the system and the major the core of the innovation is developing a surveillance system and a control tool for BXW disease. We had uh, you know, a theory of change pathway, which I'm not gonna go through the details, but we, we're just hoping that if we go through this pathway that we'll eventually be able to improve the livelihoods of banana farmers and you know, be able to cater to three major SDGs, which are critical for small order farmers. So we moved speedily, remember I'm not giving you all, of, all of the details, so we moved speedily to develop a digital tool, smartphone based application, which eventually we considered as an innovation package. The package consists of four major modules. The first one is, is really defining the problem, helping farmers to understand what the problem is. The second is really to empower farmers as skilled to conduct a, a, a home farm diagnosis of this disease. And, and the third is to is that they would understand what really is the action to be taken to be able to control without really waiting on the bureaucratic extension delivery system that doesn't even get to them maybe in several years. And the last part is a cherry on top, if you will, uh, which is more like the expert knowledge, um, best practices for them to manage the banana production. Now, at the core of this lies this specific module, diagnosis procedure, because that's really our objective. Uh, the rest certainly is catered to the farmers, but we really wanted to be able to understand what's happening in the system. So this diagnostic procedure is more of a, a decision tree 
tree algorithm that that really uh, explores or has questions from the farmer about various symptomatic expression of the disease and uh, objectively, not subjectively, objectively tells the farmer, yes, this is BXW positive incidence or no, it's there's no BXW in your farm. So essentially after, you know, BXW of course is a function of expressing expression in the leaf stem, fruit and milk bud, but after going through the diagnostic procedure, the farmer gets an answer, a binary answer, yes or no, whether, you know, their farm is infected. Now that's one part of it. We have the technology, but you need the humans to get things done. Uh, I think we're moving more into the age of human intelligence as we move into that. As we move into artificial intelligence and we use, utilize lots of tools in that domain. Anyway, so the human factor is very critical in the success of our innovation. And what we devised is, uh, um, is, is to leverage the existing uh, extension delivery system. Um, they're called former promoters within the extension delivery system. They are more or less village based. Uh, you know, extension agents that have respect and sort of knowledge above the general farmer within each village. So we leverage that network and we empower them with a tool, with a training for them to be able to engage their farmers, their peer farmers, and, and apply. Essentially, they go to each of the farm, they talk to the farmers, and they go to the farm, conduct the diagnosis, they provide the knowledge that is required. Now, what this helped us to do, but that's by leveraging the citizen engagement, we were able to have a national coverage of, uh, well, a national coverage of, uh, you know, of, of the farmers. So each of those extension agents at the various villages, they use this tool and the tool feeds into this dashboard, which is live as we speak. Uh, this is a, you know, a, you know, an animated image of the incidents report on a monthly basis, going all the way from 2021 to now 2023, uh, to, you know, April, May, June, July and August, which is this past month. As we speak, data is still flowing to this database. So we successfully did this, and this, there's nothing that has been done like this before. This is unprecedented in the history of disease surveillance or really monitoring any uh, frequently occurring challenge or threats within our cultural production systems in Africa. And we said, wow, we cracked this nut. What if we can do something else with this kind of highly georeferenced data that is now trickling into the uh, database in a, on a temporal daily basis. And we started to think that, oh, what else can we do with this? Then like a light bulb moment, we realized that for every disease incidence or non-disease incidence that is reported, there's gotta be a crop there, right? And that means that we're now having georeferenced information about the presence of banana in each of this geography. Uh, and of course, uh, maybe presence of other crop because banana usually indicate that there's other crop because they're usually co-located across small older farmers field. So anyways, that this leads to our idea about let's use this data for cropland mapping because ground truth data is a major challenge. It's a major nut that we've not been able to crack really in the, in the community of practice about how to ground truth data from remote, remotely sensed imageries. So we brought all of this data together, uh, consolidated them over time, over, I think it, this was 2020, 2019 to 2021. And we eventually plugged that into a framework where we, um, a framework for land cover classification. There were two levels to this. First thing that we thought about is that we could use this for village level cropland mapping, which is something again, that is unprecedented. And then we th thought, okay, we could do village level mapping. Then we can pr proceed to national level, national scale mapping. So to achieve this objective, this is the entry point where we have, you know, acquire, using the grant through data, the grant through data to really define where the uh, crop lines are. But on top of that, we overlaid also in an innovative way, the acquisition of drone imagery. So uh, we went to, into, into each village and we conducted multi-locational imagery dro uh, drone app imagery application with uh, imagery acquisition with a drone. And we, we simply had this rich, very fine resolution RGBs, which we'd eventually digitize manually so that we could have even more, more robust ground truth data, which complemented the incidence data that we already had. This imagery enabled us, of course, to collect data on water, other land cover types beyond the banana that we had just from the regular inflow of data. Now I'm racing through the results. I'm not gonna discuss a lot of this. Uh, we Im implemented this routine, by the way, in Google Earth Engine using uh, Landsat imagery, uh, NDVI composite, composite, composite imagery so that we could do a, a national level land cover ma mapping. But I think what might be interesting is the result to quickly talk about this in brief. 
So we use historical banana location in 2010 to define, to conduct this analysis. And we found out that between 2010 and 2019, there's been a major decline in uh, banana land cover area. And we thought, okay, how does this line up with FAO estimates? FAO estimates show that in 2019, there's 165,000 hectares of banana land area. That's a pretty large difference, you would think. And we thought maybe something is wrong with what we're doing. But as we thought the part about this, we felt that we realized and reckoned that FAO data comes from estimate, national estimate. And national estimate comes from extension agents saying, this is this farm, X. YZ farm, and this is the area. And of course, they conduct their survey and they report that upwards. But what they do not cater for is the fact that there are banana plantations and banana lands that are growing at the back of people's house that are never in, in, in the picture. They're never estimated. So this more spatially explicit framework enables us to capture true vegetation, the true area of banana land within this geography at the national level. That's the first thing to keep in mind. The second thing now is that we have this robust ground truth data that are piping through into this estimation of the, crop, uh, of, the, of the land cover estimation. And I think maybe what's useful is for you is, is that I should welcome you into imagining, I should welcome you to imagine what we can now do on a monthly basis, on a multi-temporal basis with this ground truth data, because now you have the code going in, in, in Google Earth Engine, which of course can be fine-tuned with proper co collaboration. And you have the ground truth data, which can feed in directly, pipe in from the data, from the database, from the dashboard, into Google Earth Engine as assets. And then we can simply, with a click, you know, have a representation of the land cover uh, of the land cover, you know, on a monthly basis or on an annual basis. And then we can truly, objectively, without any well, little human influence, be able to determine how much of a change is occurring, depending on whatever intervention you're deploying within this kind of geography, or even in other countries. I'm not going to belabor this. There's much more to be said. So I think maybe what's also interesting is this idea because our first focus or our entry point was this disease, right? You started to ask the question. There's a projection, two minutes more. Okay, I'm going to have to rush to this. We'll talk about this after the presentation. Um, there's this lingering question about what's, the, what's going to happen to smallholder farmers, you know, given future projection of climate change, right? We have the current climate, which, which we do have the data on for most part. You have the representative concentration pathway 6.0 and 8.5, uh, which you know def definitely different models predict what the what that's going to look like. So we ask the question: Can I'm sorry, uh, we ask the question: Can we actually understand what the risk of the spread of this disease would be based on the future climate scenario? And I'm not going to go into the methods, but you know we use MaxSense, which is a max, which is called maximum entropy model. It's a species distribution model. It ingests multiple data in different forms. For those who know it, I apologize for those who are not familiar. But there are three major components that goes into this framework. First thing is the land cover, which we already have, which cracked that nut. The the incidence of the disease, which we do have, and the ancillary variables are, are coming in as great from you know the current climate and certainly from the model predicted changes in climate. And we brought that in together into this maximum entropy model to define a, pro a probability or the risk of the occurrence of BXW disease itself. So we, this map shows the current climate, the projection for current climate or the risk assessment for current climate for the future uh, RCP 6.0 and for 8.5. This map may not tell you much if you're just looking at it visually, but let me see if I can redirect your attention. If you look at the middle ridge right here, you'd see that the risk has actually become less severe, at least less concentrated in some of this part as you move into the future. But what has happened also is that the risk has spread out more into more production land. For you to contextualize this, uh, it might be useful for you to look at these two districts right here, which are more blue, you know, in the current climate, but tending towards yellow or red in the future climate. These are regions where uh, child malnutrition and child stunting are actually very prevalent in Rwanda. So guess what? As we move into the future, this population, smallholder farmers, they are depending on this crop as a, as a source of their livelihood might eventually find themselves in a very, very dire situation. So with this, I think I should maybe just not talk about this chart. Uh, I think I should give concluding re remarks that this is just a way for us, again, it's an inspiration for us to think about how we leverage smart systems to, and use one stone to kill many birds. Not just words for I guess cropland mapping, but the fact that we're able to do digital literacy and citizen engagement by you know, going this route, 
uh, we are now reimagining or we've re reimagined and realized even the least cost pathway for high frequency assessment of cropland changes. And I think the last piece, which I think there are more, but the last piece is really unlocking and leveraging new partnerships and collaboration, you know, between humanitarian development, social, I guess, social development and, and every other aspect that we might think of. I think we can leverage this kind of system to be able to unlock those new possibilities. I want to thank you for your time and attention. I know that was a rush, but I do thank you. <laughs> I think we have time for one question. Hold on, I think it was the second uh, slide. Second slide from the beginning? Yeah. Yes, please. Okay, absolutely. Just, Happy uh, to. My, my comment may not be relevant for what you just presented. I just wanted to make. No, that's fine. What you show the trend uh, production. Oh, population. absolutely. Yeah, all the way. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, just looking at the population trend and uh, production trends, one can see 1994, there was a dip for production, which might be caused by uh, the genocides. But the one thing that I kind of found a little hard to understand is why the population trend did not change, even in 1994, while the production has uh, decreased. Oh, why the population has not decreased? Yeah. Huh? What <laughs> where's World Bank people? <laughs> where's World Bank? <laughs> I, I'm not a demographer, but um, uh, I did census in Malawi. Personally, I don't think the, the genocide, the, the, it's big enough to, to cause drop in population. To cause drop in population? I don't mean to I'm, call you uh, out. That's what I. <laughs> I mean, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not a demographer, but it's. It's. Uh, I think it's. Most people think the population drops like that with just a few, but uh, yeah, it could have. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that over the break. I was gonna say thank you, everyone, for joining our session today. We will be moving into a break, and the break is right outside this room and the Philippines room over here until three forty-five. And just for your awareness, uh, the next session in here will be a panel discussion led by our Mathematica participants, uh, and in the Philippines room, we will have a session led by our FAO participants as well. So, thank you. <laughs>